on this Sabbath morning, I join with President Eileen and give thanks for the testimony of the living reality of our Savior. His gospel has been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. The Book of Mormon is true. We are led by a living prophet today, President Thomas S. Monson. Above all, we bear solemn witness of the Atonement of Jesus Christ and the eternal blessings that flow from it. During the past few months, I have had the opportunity to study and learn more about the Savior's atoning sacrifice and how He prepared Himself to make that eternal offering for each one of us. His preparation began in pre-mortal life as He waited upon His Father, saying, Thy will be done, and the glory will be Thine forever. Beginning in that moment and continuing today, He exercises His agency to accept and carry out our Father's plan. The scriptures teach us that through His youth He went about His Father's business and waited upon the Lord for the time of His ministry to come. At the age of 30, he suffered sore temptation, yet chose to resist, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. In Gethsemane, he trusted his father, declaring, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, and then exercised his agency to suffer for our sins. Through the humiliation, of a public trial and the agony of crucifixion, he waited upon his Father, willing to be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, even as he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He waited upon his Father, exercising his agency to forgive, his, to forgive his enemies, watch over his mother, and endure to the end until his life and mortal mission were finished. I have often pondered, why is it that the Son of God and his holy prophets and all the faithful saints have trials and tribulations, even when they are trying to do Heavenly Father's will. Why is it so hard, especially for them? I think about Joseph Smith, who suffered illness as a boy and persecution throughout his life. Like the Savior, he cried out, O oh God, where art thou? Yet even when he was seemingly alone, he exercised his agency to wait upon the Lord and carry out His Heavenly Father's will, like the Savior. I think of our pioneer forebears, driven from Nauvoo and crossing the plains, exercising their agency to follow a prophet, even as they suffered sickness, privation, and even death. Why such terrible tribulation? To what end? For what purpose? As we ask these questions, we realize the purpose of our life on earth is to grow, develop, and be strengthened through our own experiences. How do we do this? The scriptures give us an answer in one simple phrase. We wait upon the Lord. Tests and trials are given to all of us. These mortal challenges allow us and our Heavenly Father to see whether we will exercise our agency to follow His Son. He already knows, 
And we have the opportunity to learn that no matter how difficult our circumstance, all these things shall be for our experience and for our good. Does this mean we always understand our challenges? Won't all of us sometime have reason to ask, Oh God, where art thou? Yes, when a spouse dies, a companion may wonder, when financial hardship befalls a family, a father will ask. When children wander from the path, a mother and a father will cry out in sorrow. Yes, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Then in the dawn of our increased faith and understanding, we arise, choose to wait upon the Lord, saying, Thy will be done. What then does it mean to wait upon the Lord? In the scriptures, the word wait means to hope, to anticipate, and to trust. To hope and trust in the Lord requires faith, patience, humility, meekness, long-suffering, keeping the commandments, and enduring to the end. To wait upon the Lord means planting the seed of faith and nourishing it with great diligence and patience. It means praying as the Savior did to God our Heavenly Father, saying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. It is a prayer we offer with our whole souls in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Waiting upon the Lord means pondering in our hearts and receiving the Holy Ghost so that we can know that all things, what we should do. As we follow the promptings of the Spirit, we discover the tribulation work of patience, and we learn to continue in patience until we are perfected. Waiting upon the Lord means to stand fast, to press forward in faith, having a perfect brightness of hope. It means relying alone upon the merits of Christ and with His grace assisting us, saying, Thy will be done, O Lord, and not ours. As we wait upon the Lord, we are immovable in keeping the commandments, knowing that we will one day rest from all our afflictions. And we cast not away our confidence that all things wherewith we have been afflicted shall work together for our good. Those afflictions will come in all shapes and sizes. Job's experience reminds us what we may be called upon to endure. Job lost all his possessions, including his land, house, and animals. His family members as well. His reputation, his physical health, and even his mental well-being. Yet he waited upon the Lord and bore a powerful personal testimony. He said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though the worms destroy this body, yet my flesh, in my flesh shall I see God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even with the shining examples of Job, the prophets and the Savior, we still find it challenging to wait upon the Lord, especially when we cannot fully understand His plan and His purposes for us. That understanding is most often given line upon line and precept upon precept. In my life, I have learned that sometimes I do not receive an answer to prayer because the Lord knows I am not ready. 
When he does answer, it is often here a little and there a little, because that is all I can bear or all that I am willing to do. Too often we pray to have patience, but we want it right now. As a young man, President David O. McKay prayed for a witness of the truthfulness of the gospel. He was in a field as a young boy, and many years later, while he was serving his mission in Scotland, that witness finally came. Later he wrote, It was an assurance to me that sincere prayer is answered sometime, somewhere. We may not know when or how the Lord's answers will be given, but in His time and in His way, I testify His answers will come. For some answers, we may have to wait until the hereafter. This may be true for some promises in our patriarchal blessings or from blessings for our family members. Let us not give up on the Lord. His blessings are eternal, not temporary. Waiting upon the Lord gives us a priceless opportunity to discover that there are many who wait upon us. Our children wait upon us to show patience, love, and understanding toward them. Our parents waited upon us and showed gratitude and compassion. Our brothers and sisters wait upon us to be tolerant, merciful, and forgiving. Our spouses wait upon us to love them as the Savior has loved each one of us. As we endure physical suffering, we are increasingly aware how many wait upon each of us. To all the Marys, and Martha's, to all the Good Samaritans who minister to the sick, succor the weak, and care for the mentally and physically infirm, I feel the gratitude of a loving Heavenly Father and His blessed Son. In your daily Christ-like ministry, you are willing to wait upon the Lord, and you are doing our Heavenly Father's will. His assurance to you is clear. Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. He knows your sacrifices and your sorrows. He hears your prayers. His peace and rest will be yours as you continue to wait upon Him in faith. Every one of us is more beloved to the Lord than we can possibly understand or imagine. Let us therefore be kinder to one another and even kinder to ourselves. Let us remember that as we wait upon the Lord, we are becoming saints through His Atonement, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon us, even as a child doth submit to his father. Such was the submission of our Savior to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. He implored his disciples, Watch with me. Yet three times he returned to them to find their eyes heavy with sleep. Without the companionship, of these disciples, and ultimately without the presence of His Father, the Savior chose to suffer our pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. With an angel sent to strengthen Him, the Savior did not shrink, but drank the bitter cup. He waited upon His Father, saying, Thy will be done, and He humbly trod the winepress alone. Now, as one of the Twelve Apostles, in these latter days, I pray that we will be strengthened to watch with Him and wait upon Him through all our days, 
on this Sabbath morning, I express gratitude that in my Gethsemane and in yours, we are not alone. He that watches over us shall neither slumber nor sleep. His angels are here and beyond the veil and round about us to bear us up. I bear my special witness that his promise is true. For he says, they wait upon the Lord and shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. May we wait upon him by pressing forward in faith that we may say in our prayers, Thy will be done, and return to him with honor in the holy name of our Savior and Redeemer, even Jesus Christ. Amen.